to what I was saying this could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. Hello everyone, what's going on? Uh, this is, of course, Coach Brian, and this uh, lesson is dedicated to two people. I want to do this in Redeemer youngster, Luca. Shout out to you guys. With you in mind, I wanted to do the part two of going against a isolated Oh, I'm sorry. We did the one where we possessed the isolated pond not too long ago in part one. This part two of the pond structure series, where now I'm going to show you victory when you are facing and against someone with an isolated. And whoever, who, who better to show you this than the, the, one of the greatest world champions ever, ever play the game? Definitely known for torturing opponents uh, with the play against an isolated pawn, and, and also my favorite player of all time, Anatoly Karpov. And in this game, he was playing Black versus Victor Krochnoy. And we're going to go get into this game. Now, before we start, actually, I want to make sure that you guys know the rules when you're facing isolated. Going against isolated pawn, rule number one is to control the square in front of the pawn. That stops the pawn from moving, and so you don't. It's hard to attack a target that can move because you might be aiming at it at, at a certain point, and then once it moves, you have to come up with a whole different strategy. So the first thing you want to do is stop it in its tracks, and then you want to trade off all the minor pieces because the owner of the pad, the isolated pawn, has more space which means they have attacking chances, especially on a castle king, like we did in part one of this series of isolated pawn. So you want to trade off all the bishops and knights. If those bishops and knights are gone off the board, then you can just concentrate and focus solely on attacking that isolated. So rule number one is to control the square in front of the pawn so it can move. Rule number two is to trade off all the knights and bishops, which are the minor pieces, so you take away the attacking chances from your opponent, and you want to at least keep one rook on the board. Uh, and you preferably want to keep the queen, because what happens is if you keep the queen on the board, that stops your opponent's king from getting involved in trying to defend the isolated pawn by coming out to the middle. So you want to keep the queen on the board as well. Also, a positive of, ha of going against isolated pawn is the square in front of it is a weak square, and that's a perfect square that you can sit a knight on outpost and we'll talk about that later in our series of imbalances under the um the title lines and squares knights needing weak squares they call them support points or outposts there's an outpost right in front of that um that isolated pawn that's perfect for a knight um so those are the rules control the square in front trade off all the minor pieces and keep at least one rook because you're going to need that rook to line up and attack that isolated pawn and hopefully win that pawn once you line those rooks up, including your queen up against that pawn, and your opponent has to defend that pawn with the rooks and queens, you have this nice little neighboring pawn, a pawn right next to uh, the file that you're attacking the isolated pawn on, and then you can attack that pawn always with one more attacker because the pawn is going to be pinned, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. Let's get right into this game. Uh, first move that was played here is four here. Um, Karpov is black here, so after the move e6, Karpov plays this because he wants to hurry up and develop quickly. Uh, when you are black, you're going to start out with down in space no matter what, so Karpov is okay with this. He plays d5 here, controlling the center of the board. Uh, then the move d4 is played, and white is still is slightly better in the opening because of his space advantage. 
uh, after bishop e7, knight f3, this regular development here, knight f6, everything is about controlling the center squares. Uh, remember that bishop g5, h6 here, attacking a piece of greater value. That's question three. He goes bishop to h4, trade right away. Black castles, one. The reason why rook c1 is played, not only do I want to overprotect my space, this is what gives me an advantage, but in some cases I'm able to trade here and have an open file ready for my rook here. So here Karpov goes d takes c4. Move e3 is played, so the bishop can attack the pawn here. It's hard to protect this pawn because if b5, knight just takes on b5, so that's not possible. Um, so here Karpov attacks the space. Remember, white has a space advantage or a development advantage guaranteed in the opening. So when, when your opponent has a space advantage, it's up to you to attack that space early. Because the longer you wait, the worse the space can get. Again, this is about um, isolated pawns, but in our imbalance series, we're going to have a bunch of videos on space as well. So after Karpov plays c5, notice that he has just as much share of the center as white does, even though white does control this center stance. Um, Bishop takes c4 was played. Now c takes d4. E takes e4, and here we go. This is an isolated. And remember, the first step we want to do is control the square in front of the pawn. Um, and we're going to see Karpov try to do this here, knight c6. Now, I guess white could try to open the position up here. But remember, when you're up in development, another imbalance, uh, the side with more development should open the position, not the side with less. And even though black has not developed the bishop and white hasn't castled, I would rather be black because my king is not in this center, like white's king. So opening the center could be very bad. White. So even though we haven't controlled the square in front of the pawn really well right now, I don't think white wants to push the pawn like we've seen in part one. A lot of the strategies uh, of owning the isolated pawn is to be able to push this pawn and start attacking chances. All right, so after knight c6, white castles here, and then Karpov starts plan number two. Of course, controlling the square in front of the pawn is plan number one, but here Karpov starts the process of trading off minor pieces. So after knight h5, he's threatening to trade. Bishop takes e7. And instead of queen takes e7, we do knight takes e7. Why? Because it helps us to control the square. Helps us. Even though white probably could still play d5 here um, and get away with it. But uh, you got to watch it. Black has this knight on the rim right now. But what he, what Karpov wants to do is bring this knight back to f6. And he's going to have two knights ready to occupy the square in front of the pawn. Remember I said this square is usually a weak square. Great square for a knight to control. And a knight to perch. Chapter 97. Bishop to Three is played, and then knight of six, and look at the control that Karpov has on the square in front of the pawn. The one thing about the, the imbalance is the grandmasters, or the best players in the world, they obey those grandmasters, and they kind of follow their plan all the way to the end. So plan number one, controlling the square in front of the pawn, Karpov has done that. And now after move 95, this is what... White is supposed to do, have active pieces. White is going to look for, bring it, he's going to probably bring the queen to f3, try to attack black's position around his castle king. So having this active knight is, is important, and it's supported by the the, spade, the pawn that's isolated, but gives white more space. So knight e5 is a very good move. Here, Karpov plays bishop b7. He's not worried about knight take d7, because remember, he wants to trade off minor pieces and we know where this bishop is going if we just think about rule number one going against the isolated pawn is controlling the square in front of the pawn you know he wants to go bishop c6 which controls the square in front of the isolated pawn all right so after bishop b7 queen e2 bringing a queen to an open file uh usually rook goes to this square but queen e2 looks okay after queen e2 we got a rook c8 there's an open file that we can fail and then knight e4, active pieces. But here, Karpov has a chance to trade here, and he does. Remember, rule number one, we want to control the square in front of the pawn. And rule number two, we would like to 
trade as many knights and bishops as we can. He does trade here. Down to e4. And then the bishops. Now, of course, white doesn't want to trade this good knight for this bishop. But if he does, we will be able to take with the other knight. Be perfectly fine. So after uh, bishop c6, there was a knight take c6 move. And then Carpathia's rook takes c6. And white is kind of disobeying all the rules when you have an isolated pawn of trading. Uh, so Karpov is looking really good now. And after rook c6, we got a rook c3. Now, we don't want to take this rook because it will make it a hanging pawn situation instead of the isolated. Um, which is a whole different imbalance. Sometimes you can convert and change, <coughs> excuse me, change the pawn structure. But uh, he didn't do that in this game. Queen d6, why? Not only so we can protect our rook, but we want to bring the other rook into the game to isolate the pawn. We're almost at our goal here. There's only one minor piece left for both sides, and look at this nice square for Karpov on d5 for the knight. For the queen d6, we have g3, rook d8. Now the isolated pawn is being attacked here, and we don't have to worry about a bunch of knights and bishops surrounding us threatening all kind of things because we traded them off. It's almost like flies around our head. And those knights and bishops are just kind of really bothersome and very annoying. Once we get rid of those knights and bishops, we can just focus on our number one goal, and that's this isolated pawn. That's what he's doing. He has two attackers here. Um, after rook d8, rook d1 protects the pawn here. And then now we have rook d6. And Karpov is being very creative here with this this rook here. Not only does he protect b7, but he's also pinning the bishop to the protection of the b2. Bishop moves, we take that. Alright, so after rook b6, we have queen one, queen to seven is seven, rook c to d3. So this is this is a both passive rooks that are doing whatever they can to protect the isolated. Um Three, rook d6. Hit our pressure here. Rook's on the open file here. Six, queen four. And then queen to c6. We would like to trade queens now because we don't need the queens on the board. We can just focus solely on the pawn. The queen still gives attacking chance. Our pop is ready. Uh, Brochnoy doesn't do that. Queen f4, and then knight d5, and there's our perch. This knight is better than a rook on this. Get the squares of cover. Uh, after knight to d5, uh, queen d2 is played. And look, he has the rook queen rook combination. All that just to protect the pawn, and that's an advantage for us, black. Because our pieces are putting pressure on that pawn, and notice that our rooks are on open file. His rooks are not on open file. All that to protect the pawn here. Um, after queen d2, queen b6, um, x-ray pressure on d4, make sure that those rooks stay passive. Queen b6, and then he goes bishop takes d5, rook takes d5, and then rook back in the queen. Queen c6. He's still protecting here. And in queen c3, he wants to trade queens and maybe attack here. And he also would hope we would trade queens so he could b takes c3 so the pawn won't be isolated anymore. Hanging pawn. And that's a different pawn structure we'll talk about later. Um, after queen to c3, have queen to d7. Again, another um, rook. Queen rook combination back in the D. But White is trying to get counterplay on other pawns on the board. So after this here, seven, here White plays F4. And the whole purpose of this is in some lines we were threatening to play E5, and it's because the isolated pawn is pinned. And that's what I mentioned before. Once you line up the rook, queen, and rook on that file, and there's no more minor pieces on the board, there's always a neighboring pawn, a pawn on the side of the file that you're using to attack the isolated pawn that you can use to 
add a fourth attacker in isolated mainly because the pawn is pinned we could take whatever is behind so f4 is to stop that pawn from playing getting played to f um to e5 here Harbaugh plays b6 so he doesn't have to worry about defending the b7 pawn anymore now rook b4 we defend d4 from the side here uh here b5 is played gaining more squares here Maybe thinking about playing a5 here, kicking the rook away from this side of d4. Um, here, white plays a4 here, b takes a4, e3. So he's trying to get really creative to try to get some counterplay because he knows this pawn doesn't have long. Uh, Karpov plays a5 here, rook takes a4, queen to b5, where he protects the pawn twice. Might have some some plans of going queen e2. And so uh, after queen b5, we have rook d2, stopping queen e2. And then the move e5, and there it goes. Now if f takes, we'll just take with the other rook because this rook is not protected, and I mean the d4 pin. Um, <clears throat> he goes f takes e5, whoops, sorry. F takes e5, and then rook takes e5, and even though pawns are still equal, that isolated pawn, we've traded some pawns, but the isolated pawn is still there. He goes queen a1, then queen to e8 is played, threatening rook e1, which was skewer the king in the After queen e8, we have e takes e5, and then rook takes on d2. And even though it looks like he got rid of his isolated pawn, it just he put it on e5 here. Uh, rook takes a5 and the move queen to c6 and currently white is now up a pawn but the pressure of the rook on the seventh rank combined with the queen might be too much here. So personal plays rook a8, seven, one check, then g6 stops the checks. Threatening queen g2 checkmate. He goes queen f1 here. Then the move queen c5. Um, I believe that finishes the Because if king h1, of course if queen f2, we just take the checkmate. And if king h1, we hit him with this move queen d5, um, which forks the rook. As soon as he moves king g1, he goes queen g2, he takes on g2, and it's game over. So, notice how Karpov used this, this pressure against the isolated pawn and kept pressuring it, and then Krochnoi had to fold. He had to kind of create counterplay, and from that pressure, he made a mistake, which allowed Karpov's rook to occupy the seventh rank here after the pressure was too much for Krochnoi. A rook on the second rank, if you're black, and on the seventh rank, if you're white, is a big time advantage. Harpov wasn't worried about the isolated pawn anymore because he had a mating net that he set up. And a lot of times when you have an imbalance, it's not that imbalance that takes you all the way to the end, you know, where you win in the game. Usually that imbalance forces your opponent to give you something even greater, like initiative. This is initiative here. Or, or line initiative combined with lines and squares, mating nets, tactics, those things all are created because of the pressure that you put on your opponent based on a imbalance. And the balance that Anatoly Karpov used here is attack against the isolated, right? Or winning against the isolated. So I have one more game to show you guys. I'll pull that up in a sec. Be right back. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. This could be us.
So back to what I was saying <laughs> This could be us So back to what I was saying This could be us This could be us So back to what I was saying This could be us This could be us So back to what I was saying this could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. This could be us. So back to what I was saying. All right. Welcome back. We're gonna uh, do another sample game. I select on. And this game was former world champion Vicilin Olaf versus Gata Komsky. Also was a he was a world champion as well when Kasparov broke away from Fide. A championship. So two former world champions um playing this game here. Gata Komsky or Vicilin Topolov from Bulgaria is white. Gata Komsky that's black here. And Started with E4, E4, Knight D5 here. And already you see Black is attacking the space immediately. Not waiting to, into in the middle game to deal with it. He's saying, I'm going to get space where I'm ready to trade. There's a lot of tension. What tension means is when pawns have contact with other pawns. They can take, but the player choose not to. And actually, intention is usually a good idea to keep that tension because you're kind of giving something up. For instance, like if white takes here, the bishop, he helps the bishop develop. If black takes here, then that pawn could be attacked twice by the knight and the queen. Um, also, if black takes on e4, then the knight is developed. So there's a lot of tension here. So <clears throat> here, white plays knight f3. Then after c4, knight takes d4, knight to c6, bishop to b5, and white has developed three pieces to black to one. Um, seven is played to 10. Then knight takes c6, 
Bishop takes c6, Bishop takes c6, B takes c6, and there's been a lot of trades here. Uh, here white plays the move four again as a little space advantage here. Bishop d6 is played here. That's a good square. And after c takes d5, c takes d5, e takes d5, e takes d5, there is your isolated. Remember the rules. You want to control the square in front of the pawn. That means the square. We would like to trade off all knights and bishops. And already white has done a good job of that because there's only a bishop and knight left. There's been a lot of trades. And we would love to put a knight on d4 because that's an outpost. Where that can never be controlled. On. Actually, I even have. <laughs> All right. So, next move, uh, top block play is castle. And then black go knight to e7, so he can castle too. And then this is the beginning. We have control over the square in front of the isolated pawn. Castles. Again, Still have control over the square in front of the isolated pawn. The biggest thing, not only are we probably threatening knight to g5 because of the weakness of h7, but we really want to just play rook d1 and start to concentrate and focus on maybe winning the isolated pawn at the right time. Remember, don't be in a rush when you're going against the isolated pawn. It's never going to be in a better position. It's always going to be isolated as long as you want it to be. You don't have to be in a rush to take it. If you have a chance to take it, but it's going to give your opponent counterplay. What is counterplay? Let's say you take the material, which is the pawn, and your opponent gets a development lead and some space. That's two imbalances for the price of one. You don't want to take the material, which is the pawn, and your opponent gets a pawn structure where or maybe he has a backward pawn or uh, that he's attacking of yours, or he gets some type of initiative from it, which is the three questions not worth it right it, it'll be there you'll come back to it make sure you take it at the right moment after queen to d7 um looks like he's trying to get his rooks connected and maybe in a position where he, he has to protect that pawn uh, there goes rook to d1 keeping the pressure on the pawn of course we can't take this now because the knight is protecting it guess what your pieces have better things to do in the chess game than to protect the pawn. So if this knight has to sit here and protect the d5 pawn, you're in a good position already. <clears throat> uh, here, he brings his rook to d8 because he wants to kind of relieve the pressure of the knight from defending it so that his rook can be in position to defend it. Bishop to e3. Why? Because we want to control the square in front of the pawn. Uh, here he plays a5 here. Okay, so I think the reason for this is so the rook is free to move away because notice the bishop was targeting a7. And you don't want to have the burden of protecting that a pawn. This is, even though this is an isolated pawn, it's not on an open file, so it's not considered a weakness because of that. Um, but again, this pawn needs to be protected by a piece if it's being attacked. So that could be a burden on the piece. So that's why he's pushing it forward, gives him a little more space. He might want to push it even farther create some weaknesses on white's camp. D3 is played. Uh, one of the main reasons for this is so there is no bishop takes h2, no queen seven attacking h pawn. The king could also have a great home on g2 since black doesn't have any light square bishops. Six played here. Bishop to b6 attacking a piece of greater value. That's question three. Rook c8. And the bishop goes back to the square in front of the pawn. Why? We would like to go bishop to e5 or knight e5. Notice how he's not really worried about the pawn just yet. And then there is a chance to trade minor pieces. He doesn't trade here. Interesting. Could have taken here and after rook takes, maybe put the knight here and square. But now I'm thinking, uh, Topalov thinks that maybe he could attack the weaknesses around the white's king or black's king with this bishop on c3. Probably it's, maybe that's possible here. Bishop c3 is trying to trade again. And he moves the bishop away again to five. Uh, looks like God of is looking for a draw. He's just going to follow the bishop everywhere. Um, but Topolov 
allows the trade right now. There's a trade, and here we go. We have traded off all the minor pieces except for the rook here to defend the knight on e5. And now rook to c7. Queen to f3, which attacks f7 here. See how Toploff is not forcing it with this pawn, this isolated pawn. It's the pressure on the isolated pawn that gives you um, chances on other parts of the board. And this is why f7 is a target now. Goes rook f8. Then he puts his king on g2 because now his king is a little bit safer on a light square. And there's no back rank problems later on. Uh, after rook to b7, he plays the move h4 here. Um, looks like he's anticipating moves like knight to g6. Maybe he wants to play h5. But also h5 could prevent knight to g6. Queen to c3. Next rook up, protecting d2. Still has his rooks on his open files, and he has not forgot about this isolated pawn here. Queen to a4, attacking a2. Plays the move. Attacking a piece of greater value. Queen back to b4. The patience that uh, white has here. He goes knight d3. Not only is this attacking the queen, but I believe he wants to bring this knight to f4 and put pressure on the d5 pawn. Place h5, that stopped knight uh, g6 there. Seven, and there's knight to f4. Now we have one, two, three on the isolated pawn. And now he felt like he was forced to move it forward, and now this is just a new target for him. Boom. Two on the pawn here. Moves a knight to c6. Defend the pawn that way. Three. That stops knight before. Among other things, <clears throat> rook to d8. Still trying to keep this defended as much as he can. And now we shift our attention to the queen side. From the king side, we back to the um, press pressure on the pawn. And now looks like we're on the queen side here. Uh, he goes knight before, and I actually think that now it's going to be easier for us after these knights come off. Now we just can concentrate on the pawns here. Look at that move. This is nice. Rook takes d4, because if you go queen takes, we just go rook takes c7. And we pretty much have won a pawn. We're also threatening uh, queen takes f7. Checkmate. Not checkmate. Definitely a pawn. So he doesn't take that. He goes queen to f8. And then rook takes eight, takes here, rook takes, takes, and now white is just up a pawn. And that's what we want to do when we're putting pressure on isolated pawn. If we can win the pawn or win another pawn based on that pressure we put throughout the middle game, being patient, waiting until our opponent makes a mistake, boom, there's a mistake. Now we're up a pawn. And now we switch our imbalance to material now. We're up a pawn. And sometimes when you win something, you find that your pieces, this is one of the rules in our system of implods, you find some of your pieces are kind of out of sorts. It's good to bring those pieces back to the center and come up with a new plan based on your new imbalance, and that's material. So since we have an extra pawn, you want to make this pawn an active participant in the game. Your extra pawn is over here. See how he does this. So here he goes check here, which helps him defend the pawn here. And it also stops, uh, notice how his queen prevents any check on white's queen, because the queen covers this whole diagonal. Once that goes away, uh, looks like we can just push this forward. Ah, he doesn't. He checks. Ah, that's what he did. So he knew he can come here and check, and then check here, and then pick up another pawn. And he does that. And so now white is up two pawns here. It's so the only thing black could do is try to perpetually check the king if that's possible. Let's check here. King goes to g1. He checks there. King goes to h2. Now there's no more checks. So the only possibility for black is to somehow put pressure on this pawn here that's weak by going like queen to f1. He goes queen to c2. Oh, he attacks both pawns here. But after queen e1, um, after, 
after queen e1. He protects f2. I have some students coming in, so um, <laughs> sorry about that. After queen e1, he plays h2. Look at the king coming closer to the center. There were some problems with queen e8. Black attacks both pass pawns at the same time. Queen to b4, check. And now we use our king to protect f2. Uh, here he's going to e5 because he wants to uh, start the checking process again, maybe on d5. White um, threatens to go queen f3. If you go queen d5, queen f3 protects and the king and the pawn at the same time. So queen b2, check. And we protect our b3 uh, pawn again, and we're ready to push these pawns forward. All it takes is patience. He takes a a3, but we take on f7, and we're back to c4. And he's just trying to find a position where he can put his queen on the diagonal and start to march the pawns up. There we go. And in this position, black, did, black felt that it was over at this point. Check here. We're just going to go here. Um, Yes. Well, actually, no. We can go queen to g2. And then you don't have any more checks. And once we play moves like queen to e4, we're going to be ready to push this pawn up. So slowly but surely, we're going to push that pawn, get another queen, game is over. This is another example of winning against the isolated pawn, putting pressure on the isolated pawn, which brings up other imbalances in the game that will help you win uh, in different ways, like material. Um, that is the last game uh, example I'm going to show. Again, this is dedicated to uh, my boy Henry Deemer and the young up-and-coming Implodian, Luca. Um, and we will have more uh, videos um, according to the imbalances, part three. Uh, pawn structure will be double pawns, and we'll talk about that uh, in the upcoming video. I'm Coach Brian for all the Implodians. So back to what I was saying. <laughs> Could be us.